Welcome back. We have two missions in this fourth video. Our first is to bring scientific method, careful observation and cold rational thought and analysis rather than strong opinion to our avocation. Our second mission in this video is to complete five tasks. First, to understand the powerful forces that act on our bullet the moment it leaves the barrel. Second, we're going to learn to use one of the ballistic apps on our computer, wind meter, or iPhone so we can compensate for those forces. Third, we're going to develop intuition about the effects of each of the forces and their relative importance by developing proficiency with our software. And, and next, we're going to consider the differences and the value of measurements in angles, mills, and minutes. And finally, we're going to learn to calculate ranges in the field using our scope's reticle. Understand these variables, these forces, learn how to compensate for them, and you will be well along your path to excellence. Friends, the moment, the instant, the bullet leaves the barrel, important, powerful forces immediately act on it. Understanding, then compensating for those forces, will be essential steps and you're hitting that far, far away target. You ready? Let's get started. Uh, first, a few definitions. You can think about the field of ballistics as, as having three separate elements or divisions. Internal ballistics refers to what happens inside the cartridge and rifle barrel as the cartridge fires. We carefully reload our cartridges to keep the variables in this first phase at a minimum. Terminal ballistics refers to the action of the bullet on a target, especially as it impacts soft tissues. In this video, we're going to spend all of our time in what is known as external ballistics. Everything that happens in between. Everything that happens as the bullet flies to the target. External ballistics, friends, is all about forces, phenomena that push or pull the bullet away from where you want it to hit. The first and most important force is gravity. Gravi gravity operates all the time. Gravity operates everywhere. Once our bullet leaves the barrel, it immediately begins to fall, immediately. Even though we tilt our barrel up a bit. Fortunately for us today, with the tools that we have, gravity is the easiest force to compensate for. For our shooting problems, we can consider that, that light travels in a straight line. Light to photons come straight back from the target through our scope onto our retina. Call that the line of sight. Our scope is mounted generally two and a half to three inches above the barrel. We must tilt the barrel up to compensate for the bullet drop caused by gravity. So the bullet, starting say a couple of inches below the barrel, will at some point fly up through our line of sight, go above the line of sight, then fall down through our line of sight again at the target, if we have set our scope reticle correctly. The bullet path through the air is not a perfect parabola because the bullet slows down, but more importantly, the farther it goes, the faster it falls because gravity accelerates its drop. Right away, you can see serious problems for us shooters to solve, can't you? Our, our first task is to determine how far away the target is from our muzzle. You know, at a range, we we know the distances, but in the field, we don't. There are ways to calculate that distance using your scope's reticle. And if you want to learn reticle range estimation, I will show you how to do so at the end of the video. I should say also that military snipers are taught this range estimation exercise. So you might be interested, but I, I must warn you, the farther away you get from the muzzle, the seriously less accurate the system becomes, which is the circumstance when knowing the absolute distance becomes critical. For now, for us, we're going to use a laser range finder. Oh, by the way, don't buy one yet. Borrow a friend's. Now, at this point, we're going to learn about ballistic programs. Good for us, good people have put a lot of scientific data acquisition, real-world observations into developing apps that allow us closely to predict how our bullets behave as they fly down range. Basically, what we need to know to use these programs is the weight of our bullet and how fast it leaves our muscle. 
for our examples, I'm going to recommend you go to the Hornady website and use their free program. Now get ready to hit your pause button. Fire up your computer. Follow along. On the Hornady website, make sure that the 4 Degrees of Freedom, 4DOF, window is open. Now you, you don't need to read those instructions or, or the overview, the, which is the theory behind the program at this moment, but I urge you to look into the theory in the future. For now, scroll down. Begin by putting a name to your task. Then start filling in the blanks. Every time you see a down chevron, you will have a choice. Uh, fortunately, uh, we can find our bullet in the Hornady Library, so its, it's data is there for us. Click on it and the program autofills many of the windows. Now, when you get to the environment section, I'll ask you to enter four miles an hour for the wind. And don't worry about that number now. We'll talk about wind uh, a lot later. By the way, click on the spin drift box. Now, click on calculate. You will immediately see lots and lots of data. Scroll down to the 600 yard distance. Notice we have to elevate our turret 14.65 round that to 14.75 because the new scopes generally give us quarter minute clicks. 14.65, 600 yards, 88 inches. What a big drop. Rotating that turret up that many minutes should, should compensate for the 600 yard drop. By the way, that turret elevation number may not be perfect for your rifle. We're going to confirm these so-called come-ups in the next video. Uh, now we come to a common point of confusion. The idea of minutes and mils. Simply said, minutes and mils measure downrange and angles rather than linear measurements like inches and feet on the target. Let's consider minutes, or more, more precisely said, minutes of angle. For our uses, we're going to consider that one minute is the angle that will subtend one inch, one inch wide at 100 yards. Two at 200, 3 at 300 yards. The angle stays constant, but the further away you get from your eye, the more inches that angle subtends, doesn't it? Uh, and at this point I have to say, not only is this one number not exactly correct, there are two ways to determine what a minute actually measures at distance. If you want to know details right now, I strongly recommend you go to Ryan Kleckner's book, Long Range Shooting Handbook. See his chapter in discussion about minutes of angle. Yeah, his is about the clearest explanation I've seen about this idea, that, the idea that many of our shooting colleagues tend to overcomplicate. My scope reticles are all calibrated in minutes. The edge of the central cross is one minute. Here's six minutes. Here are 12 minutes. You get the idea your scope reticle might instead be calibrated in mils rather than minutes. Uh, and these are, are known as mil dot reticles. No problem. Instead of inches and yards, use meters and centimeters. The average palm is, is about 10 centimeters wide. A mil at 100 meters, meters not, not yards remember, is about 10 centimeters, one palm width. One click on a mil dot scope usually, usually, moves the point of impact a tenth of a mil, or a centimeter at a hundred meters, or, or a tenth the width of your, your palm. But an, an easier rule of thumb is to think that a finger is about two centimeters across. Uh, two clicks. Okay, that was an awful pun. I'm sorry. But we're going to use these concepts and rules of thumb later when we want to move our turrets to compensate for differing distances and the ever-varying wind. You know, friends, a serious problem comes when we try to mix mils and minutes on the, on the same scope. A lot of the older scope reticles were graduated in mils rather than minutes, but their turrets were calibrated in minutes. The pros made it work, of course. Yes, if you need to make a change, you can do that calculation. Uh, but in a match or the heat of battle, good luck. I cannot. If you have a mil dot radical, please make sure your turret elevation and windage changes are also in mils. If you have a minute based radical, make certain your elevation and windage turrets make changes in minutes of angle. Mix the two, watch what happens during the next match. Oh, right at this point we should say a word about the term quotes hold off. An example, 
Sometimes the situation changes so rapidly, the shooter does not have time to twist his turret. The antelope that was looking at you at 400 yards suddenly decides to move out to 450. A glance at your hunting rifles come up tells you that the difference between 400 and 450 yards is about an additional 10 inches of bullet drop. Rather than aim for the antelope's heart, the shooter will quickly elevate the scope crosshairs 10 inches above the heart. We'll go into this idea of hold off a lot more when we talk about compensating for inevitable rapid changes in the winds. Oh, by the way, you will likely surprise yourself how quickly you learn to operate that elevation turret and how much you need to rotate it for those really long ranges. One caution, though, at the end of your practice session, always, always return that knob back to your baseline, 100 yards zero. The next most important force after gravity is the wind. Long story short, the wind is going to drive you crazy. If you're in a flat range, say, like Camp Perry, the wind will usually, usually, be fairly consistent from your shooting position to the target. But in the real world, the sniper's world, the long distance shooter's world, wind consistency along a bullet's path is a dream. Take my range, Pala. We shoot across a valley, up a hill. Say we have a five mile an hour wind at the bench, the wind coming from our nine o'clock. The wind may be 10 miles an hour halfway down the range. Then it often veers coming directly at us down the hill toward the target. So, worse, since our bullet flies 40 to 50 feet above the ground as it travels up to that target, the wind up there is significantly faster than it is on the ground surface with these conditions. When our ballistic program calls for four minutes of wind way out there, we often actually need 10, 10 minutes. Conditions like these are where an AR wins the day. See how far your first round misses, then quickly compensate on the next shot. Of course, that technique doesn't work in a match, does it? What a bummer. Let's go back to our program. We have dialed in four miles an hour of wind. Not, not much. It's a wind that we, we can feel lightly on our face. It tells us that at 600 yards, the wind will have pushed our bullet to the right a little over 11 inches. Since we're shooting at a 12 inch plate, if we don't make a correction, we're likely most of the time to miss the target. Critical question, how do we tell how fast the wind is blowing? You can get a rough idea by using a lot of the info in the various manuals. F feel the breeze lightly on your face, that's three to four miles an hour. Blowing tumbleweeds and trash across the range, 20 miles an hour. Sorry, not accurate enough for our needs. Ah, then there's the, the, this idea of mirage, the wavy lines that you see in your scope when conditions are just right. Ground gets heated by the sun and air next to the ground rises because hot air is lighter than cooler air nearby. So yes, the air on the range will rise, but not smoothly. It swirls up turbulently. This turbulence can be seen through your scope. A wind from the side tilts the swirls. It is said that the tilt indicates the wind's velocity. And if you go to the internet, you'll find any number of people telling you how precisely they can tell the wind by seeing how those wavy lines appear and change from moment to moment. Friends, there's only one way, it's a wind meter. You can find used wind meters quite inexpensively on eBay. At the other end of the high dollar scale is the Kestrel. The latest Kestrel is incredible. It has built in Hornady, four degrees of freedom ballistic programs, which is what we've been using. So you have everything you need in one tool. Shooting only at a range where you know the exact distances, an inexpensive meter will do. In the field, though, I carry my Kestrel. Uh, now more about hold off. Peter and I find that out to about 500 yards, the, the spotter is more effective telling the shooter to hold off some number of inches. He might say, for example, hold nine inches left of center. Beyond 500 yards, though, we like to give the call in minutes, as in hold nine minutes right of center. Uh, given the precision of today's reticles, that system is quite fast. On the other hand, there is no, no absolute rule. Do your own experimenting, see what you like best. As long as shooter and spotter understand each other, 
as long as we communicate clearly, no problem, whatever works, works. Oh, one almost invariant rule though, essentially, all long range shooters elevate the scope turret to correct for distance, but almost no one rotates the windage knob to correct for wind. Especially in high and shifting winds, we use the markings on the scope reticle to determine the correct holdoff. Correctly figuring out the wind, known in this sport as calling the wind, is what separates the pros from the amateurs. Expect to take years to learn this skill. Remember how, when we were setting up back in the ballistic program, I asked you to check the box marked spin drift? In America, essentially all of our barrels are rifled with a twist to the right. For complicated reasons, this makes the bullets drift a bit to the right. And, and you can see that number here. At 600 yards, it's 2.6 inches right drift. At longer distances, that, that drift is pretty much proportional. So spin drift becomes much more of a factor the farther we try to shoot. When we add its effect, 2.6 inches, to the effect of the wind coming from our 9 o'clock, we get a total of about 14 inches that we need to compensate for. When air is less dense, there is less resistance to the bullet's passage through the air. Let's see how important this effect is by going back to our, our table. Let's assume that first we are shooting in Florida at sea level, and then in Denver, 5,000 feet. For Miami, the program calls for 14.46 minutes elevation. Denver, 14.4 minutes. Not much of a needed change, is it? Let, let's try the experiment a different way. The barometer is 30.93, and a storm is coming. It's going to fall to 29.93, a whole inch difference. For the high pressure, denser air, the program asks for 14.65 minutes of elevation. But in the less dense air, lower pressure, 14.44 minutes. Not much change from atmospheric effects, right? Well, what about temperature changes? Doing the same exercise, first at 45 degrees, 14.77 minutes. If the temp goes up to 95 degrees, 14.3 minutes. Not much. Oh, one critical point right now. You must not let your ammunition lie in the sun at the range. I've seen cartridges get up to 130 degrees Fahrenheit when left in the sun. This is the temperature range where the manufacturers pressure test their barrels by heating ammunition. Let the sun heat your ammunition and you may blow up your rifle. It's not intuitive, but more humid air is less dense, so we should expect less need to come up when the humidity is high. Let's go from Miami, 98% humidity, to our Anza Breger Desert, where the humidity is 10%. Keeping everything constant except the temperature. In Miami, we need 14.26 minutes. In our desert, 14.36. Not much change, right? Now, the, these exercises should give you an idea of how important atmospherics are or not. Nonetheless, why not take them into, into consideration in our calculations? Uh, because when we progress to firing at really long ranges, they, they become important. And the programs give you this, this option built in. So why not take advantage? Are you shooting uphill or downhill? The bullet will see gravity over a lesser distance and will drop less. But don't forget the wind. The bullet faces the wind throughout its entire path. Same exercise, now with a 30 degree downward shot. Remember, for straightaway we needed 14.36 minutes of elevation. The target downhill 30 degrees, only 9 minutes. Geometry is significant, isn't it? But fortunately, our program allows us to figure our needs quickly. By the way, when we get to the range in the last video, I'll show you how to use your cell phone to determine the angle up or the angle down. We live on a rapidly spinning sphere. So as shooting distances increase significantly, especially well beyond 1,500 yards, we're going to have to take into consideration our position on the Earth, plus the direction we're shooting. We launch our rockets as near to the equator as we can get because the Earth's velocity is greater standing on the equator than if we were standing on the North Pole. 
you know, a better way to say that would be to say that the rotational angular velocity is greater near the equator than near the poles. Aim due north while you're in San Diego and the bullet will hit a bit to the right of where you aim. Aim due east and the bullet will hit a bit high. At our shooting distances, we can safely ignore these facts. Nonetheless, they're fun to think about, aren't they? And again, I recommend Ryan Kleckner's book if you'd like to understand these effects better. You know, it's not so easy to calculate anything in the heat of battle or in the middle of a match, but there is one formula that I urge you to memorize and also glue to the side of your rifle. Say you've fired some number of rounds. They are consistently high. Something has changed. You don't know what it is. The important thing is you need to bring your bullets back down to the center of the target. Assume we're, we're shooting at that 24-inch steel plate and you're hitting at 12 o'clock. You need to come down 12 inches. So here's the formula. Distance in inches needed to move divided by the range in hundreds of yards equals the minutes to rotate the target. If you were shooting at 850 yards and you needed to move 12 inches, it would be 12 divided by 8.5 or, or 1.4 minutes of change. And we'd round off that change to 1.5 since we have quarter minute clicks on our scope. You know, I, pro I promised I would show you this technique, though I don't recommend it. Yes, military instructors still teach the ability to use the tick marks on a scope, be they mil dots or minutes, to calculate a target's distance from you. Trouble is, the, the farther away the target, the way less accurate the system is. I urge you now, at least for now, to forget trying to learn to judge range by using your reticle and further to skip this whole section. Yeah, you heard me right. <laughs> Skip this whole section. Okay, you're not going to do it. Here we go. Here's a man-sized target. Assume that the average male has a shoulder width of, of, of 20 inches. I just measured mine. But on the other hand, I'm a little guy. My friend Jim is 30 inches across the shoulders. Keep those two numbers in mind. Ask yourself how many minutes this target subtends. I get about 3.2. Here's the formula. Size in inches times 95.5 divided by your estimate in minutes equals range in yards. The big assumption, the real source of error, is that you think you know the size of the target. My numbers. 20 inches times 95.5 divided by 3.2 minutes, 597 yards away. So let's say it's not me, but a, a big guy, Jim, is down there. 30 inches times 95.5 divided by 3.2, 895 yards, 597 versus 895, what a difference. Maybe this technique is such a great idea after all. Another problem that increases the farther away we, uh, we get from our target is our inability to, to judge the precise number of minutes. So we think the same target measures 2.2 minutes. That's about 870 yards away. If we mismeasure by only a tenth of a minute, easy to do, the math says 830 yards. The error causing a 30 inch difference in bullet strike. To make practical matters worse, say you're a military sniper, how often does your target hold still so that you can make an accurate judgment of the number of tick marks? He subtends. Oh, and by the way, I'm not pointing a rifle at my friend. The scope is on an AR-10 upper, no lower. Uh, yeah, you, you, you can do the same calculations with a mil dot rather than a minute-based scope, but for me, I find the judgment errors even greater. But don't believe me, do the experiments yourself. Want to know how far that way that target is? Use a laser rangefinder. I'll say it again, use a laser rangefinder. Friends, in the next video, we're going to bring together all of this new knowledge to place a bullet where we wish, to do so reliably with the highest probability, and do so at the moment we wish. And that wish will almost always center on a target that presents itself far, far away, and with the troublesome wind swirling around us. Remember, our primary mission, the basis of everything I've just shown you, 
is based in science and the foundation of science is careful unbiased observations of your own results than cold rational analysis. Now on to some fun at the range in the next video. See you next time.